morning, Emmanuel. So this morning's Bible reading is taken from Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 to 21. Let us hear the word of the Lord. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles, because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile, and are not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful, sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Mark. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Emmanuel from my side. Um, great to have you along. I hope that you're enjoying the long weekend. Anyone managed to get Friday off? No? Oh, this is a rough crowd. Oh, one person at the back. Harry got Friday off because Harry's in school. Um, but I hope that at least you enjoy the public holiday tomorrow if you didn't get Friday off. We're pressing on in our uh, series in the book of Galatians, and uh, I think this morning we come to maybe the most important passage. If we can say there is a most important passage, it really gets to the very heart of what the book is about. So let's ask for God's help. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you again for this chance to come together around your word, to have you address us, and to be able to conform our lives more and more into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, will you use this time uh, to that end? And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Louis started with a question. Uh, I'm gonna, he asked, are you happy? I'm going to ask a slightly different question, and that is, is God happy with you? Uh, I don't know if you've ever asked that question. We do find ourselves, I think, wondering that from time to time. Is God actually happy with me? Maybe you've had a rough week. Maybe you've had a rough year. Uh, maybe you've messed up again and uh, you've given into temptation. Maybe it is that you've just neglected your relationship with God and it feels like there's this distance that's grown in your relationship with God. And you're wondering to yourself, is God pleased with me? Or is he disappointed? Maybe he's angry with me. And then you might be thinking, what do I need to do in order to get back on his good side, if that's the case? Well, these are the kind of questions, whether consciously or unconsciously, that often guide our relationship with the Lord, that, we're, we're kind of, that are stewing in the back of our minds as we try and live the Christian life. This passage gets right to answering those questions. And the answers that it gives us may surprise you, and I hope will shift in the way that you ask those questions, and even in the way that you think about your life. It's a passage that, um, that centers on probably the most dramatic confrontation in the early days of the church. Uh, Paul, the apostle to the Gentile, versus Peter, the apostle to the Jews. 
Peter, the, the close friend of Jesus, the disciple, versus Paul, the one who is now writing this letter to the Galatians. And, and just look at verse 11, for example, how the passage begins. When Cephas, that is Peter, another name for Peter, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Paul rebukes Peter and says in front of everybody, Peter, you are behaving like an unbeliever. Wow. Wow. What happened? What happened to make Paul say something like this? And why does Paul bring it up at this point in a letter to the Galatians? The Galatians weren't even there when it happened. They might not even have known about this incident. Certainly, it's long since been resolved. Peter and Paul are back on good terms. Why does he dredge up the past? And the answer, of course, is because it is incredibly relevant to the Galatian situation. And it goes right to the heart of the question I asked, how does God think of us? How are we acceptable in his sight? So what I'd like to do this morning is just have a look at the details of the confrontation. We do need to understand what was going on and what led to it and what it was all about. And then try and draw out two implications for us in the way that we live as a result of what we learn. So let's start with the incident, the Peter-Paul incident. And, uh, and we'll kick off by looking at Peter's actions first. Let's look at what Peter did uh, before we get to Paul's, uh, to, to Paul's response. Now, Peter, as you may know, was the kind of guy who tended to get himself into trouble by doing dumb things. Uh, of course, most famously, the night before Jesus' uh, trial, when he denied Jesus three times, what did he do this time? Must have been a big deal for Paul to rebuke him publicly the way that he did. Let's look again from verse 11. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. So it seemed to have all started because of a decision that Peter made about who to have supper with. Peter, of course, one of the key Christian leaders, an apostle commissioned by Jesus himself, and at some point in those early days, uh, Peter decides to go visit Paul in Antioch, which is up north from Jerusalem. And it could well have been actually when he broke out of jail or the angel broke him out of jail. Do you remember that story in Acts chapter 12? We're, we're told, we're, we read in Acts chapter 12, after Peter was miraculously given this prison break, he left for another place. And, and there's a very good chance that he went up to Antioch, try and get away from all the heat in Jerusalem, try and la, la, lay low for a while. Now, the key thing to know about Antioch is that Antioch is a Gentile city. In other words, a non-Jewish city. It was fast, in fact, becoming the new headquarters for Christianity because Jerusalem was becoming more and more unsafe. So Peter decides to go and visit Paul. Now, try and get into the shoes of someone like Peter. Peter has grown up his whole life as a Jew. He has followed Jewish customs and practices. He's been a devout uh, follow the Jewish religion. And now for the first time, he goes, perhaps for the first time in his life, to a major Gentile city. All of his life, he's been told, you don't mix with non-Jews, you don't eat with them, you don't hang out with them. Uh, the cleanliness laws, the food laws of the Old Testament prohibited it. So what is he going to do? Well, fortunately for Peter, God has actually prepared him for this moment. That's why we read that passage from Acts chapter 10. Because earlier on, God had actually given Peter this incredible vision. And it's a vision of this huge blanket of food being lowered in front of Peter. It's my favorite kind of dream to have. And there Peter sees this kind of array of just incredible food that God puts before him. The only problem is that none of it is actually able to be eaten by a Jew. Right? They're all forbidden animals and uh, forbidden food types, according to the Old Testament laws. But God says to Peter, go on, tuck in, enjoy. Because God is now teaching Peter that all of the Old Testament laws have been fulfilled uh, by Jesus. They've served their purpose. And so the Jewish way of seeing things needs to be completely overhauled. God no longer has one nation that needs to separate themselves off from every other nation. God has declared all people welcome in Jesus. Jesus has opened up the way for salvation. So those food laws no longer apply. They've served their purpose. And more importantly, not only are there no longer unclean foods, there are no longer unclean people. All barriers have been torn down 
because of Jesus' death on the cross. Now anybody can be part of God's people, which is good news for Gentiles like us. I'm, I'm guessing that most of us are Gentiles here this morning, and none of this would be true if it wasn't for what Jesus did. So here's Peter. He's getting this vision. He's invited to tuck into the prawns and the bacon and whatever it is that's in front of him. And when the vision is over, God then arranges for Peter to have a visit by a Gentile, a leading Gentile, actually. Here's a test. Will Peter actually get what the vision was about? And what we find out is, yes, he does. He goes along with Cornelius to his house. He enjoys this fellowship, this, this uh, time together with these Gentile believers. So let me just read from Acts 10 again, from verse 34. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but he accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Lesson learnt. But will it be a lesson remembered now that Peter, a little bit later, is in Antioch? So here we are, back in the story in the book of Galatians. Peter's gone to visit Paul in Antioch, and at first he is enjoying this new freedom that he has in Christ. He's hanging out with the Gentiles. He's eating those pork ribs and the prawns and the bacon and eggs. The gospel has set him free. But then something happens that causes him to lose his nerve. And what we read in verse 12 of Galatians 2 is that certain men from James came to town. Now, that's James, Jesus' brother from Jerusalem. I don't think they came with James's backing, by the way, because James, we already knew from last week's passage, has already figured out that the gospel is for everyone. But they've probably come from his church, and they've come with a bit of clout. And so when they arrive, we're told that Peter backpedals. When these men come, these men who were given this nickname here, the circumcision group, that tells us something of what they were insisting, that the Gentiles observed, that they observed circumcision as a way to be acceptable to God. And when Peter sees them, he loses his nerve. Verse 12, for before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. Peter's saying, what? I don't have any spare ribs. This is not spare rib sauce on my mouth, right? I haven't touched them. He loses his nerve, doesn't he? Because he's afraid of what they might think, that he is maybe selling out his Jewish heritage. You know how often our Christian witness is compromised out of fear, isn't it? Fear of people. Now, the problem, of course, is Peter, being such a high-profile leader, his actions don't just affect himself, they affect others as well. Verse 13, the other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. So suddenly, instead of a united Christian church, united by Christ around this one gospel, you have this divide. Jews, Gentiles, no longer fellowshipping together. It's a spiritual apartheid, isn't it? Well then, what was Paul's reaction? Let's look at that. As we've already seen, Paul pulled no punches. Verse 14. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you're a Jew, and yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? In other words, Peter, you've, you've realized that God has opened up the way for us to have this freedom, and you're enjoying it. You're living like a Gentile, in other words. How is it that you're now forcing Gentiles to become more Jewish before you'll hang out with them? Now, it's not that Peter had stopped believing that God accepts all people. The problem was that his behavior wasn't in line with what he believed. The word that Paul uses in verse 13 is he was behaving like a hypocrite. That's the word. See, hypocrisy is when you say you believe something, but your actions say something else. And we're all guilty of hypocrisy from time to time. It could be in your business. You know, you you say you're a believer, but if we had to ask your clients about how you treat them or how you do your business dealings, they would say otherwise. It could be, you know, in your own uh, home environment or the way you relate to your family. Whatever it is, sometimes we do act in a way that contradicts what we say we believe. But here with Peter, there's a particular kind of hypocrisy that is at play that is, in actual, in actual fact, far more serious. Because what his actions are saying completely undermine the very truth of the gospel itself. 
And this is why Paul brings up the incident here in this letter. Because the real issue is this, on what basis does God accept us? On what basis is God happy with us? And Peter is being a hypocrite because although he says God accepts all people because of Jesus, he is making these Gentiles jump through religious hoops in order to be acceptable to God. In effect, he's saying to them, you're not good enough. You need to become more Jewish. That's why this is such an important issue and why Paul brings it up here. See, does God only accept us if we measure up to some additional standards? No, God accepts us because of what Jesus has done. The gospel says we can never be acceptable uh, by doing some sort of regulations or measuring up in some way before God. We can never do that. The only way we're ever acceptable to God is because of what Jesus has done. And because of what he has done on the cross, we can now be forgiven and accepted and called God's own children. So that although we are guilty in his sight, he can declare us not guilty. What an astounding thing that is. The technical word that Paul uses here is God can justify us. That's such an important word, to to know that God justifies us. Look at verse 15. He says it three times just so we don't miss it. He says, we who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, he says, look, if anybody should know this, it should be us Jews, because the whole of our Old Testament story tells us that God couldn't possibly accept us based on law keeping. We never got that right. The only hope we ever had was if we trusted in God's promises to us, took him at his word. We Jews know this, he says, verse 16, so we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Do you see what he's saying? No one is justified, either by keeping the Old Testament law or by the Ten Commandments or by any kind of personal moral code you might be trying to live by. It's not going to do it. Because there is no way of undoing all the mess that we've got ourselves into, all of our sin and all of our guilt before God. You cannot make that go away. It doesn't matter how good you try. But Jesus can. And that's exactly what he did on the cross. He dies for us. He dies instead of us. And he pays the penalty for all of our sin so that God can justify us, acquit us in his sight. And all we have to do is to trust him. Faith, right? We just have to entrust ourselves to him. Can you see why Peter's actions are so harmful? Because he is trying to hold these Gentiles to a standard that only ever shows up their flaws. That's all the law can do. It just shows us to be lawbreakers. And I think that's what he means in verse 17 and 18. He says, if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, in other words, if I hold people to the law, then I really would be a lawbreaker, because that's all the law can do, show me to be a lawbreaker. So Paul's whole point in dredging up this incident in this letter is that the Galatians would realize they don't need to do anything external in order to be acceptable to God. Certainly not get circumcised or keep away from certain foods or observe a certain day. All they need is to trust in Jesus. That's all they need. And God accepts them on the basis of what he has done, not on the basis of what they do. Do you realize that? Do you know that for sure this morning? But that's how God accepts you? Please, you have to be clear on this. Well then, what do we learn from this incident? Is this just some sort of internal squabble over a small point of theology? No, not at all. This couldn't be more practical. So I want to just spend a few minutes thinking about two ways in which this impacts our thinking. And Paul goes on to talk about this a bit further in the passage. This showdown gets right to the heart of the gospel. And it shows us why the gospel is so different from every other way of thinking about God or ourselves or this world. Two ways in which it shows how different the gospel is. Number one, the gospel, the gospel of grace, indicates and means that I don't need to prove myself. I don't need to prove myself. Not to God and not to others. God has accepted me. And if he's accepted me, I don't have to prove myself to anybody. Anybody. 
His approval is all that ultimately matters, isn't it? It doesn't matter what other people think, because God loves me. You see, why did Peter do what he did? Well, he did it, we're told, because he was afraid. He was intimidated by these Jewish leaders. And so he felt he had to prove himself in some way to them, and ultimately perhaps to prove himself to God, that he really was serious about his religion. But you see, if God loves you, not because of you, but because of Jesus, then you don't have to prove yourself to anybody. The gospel says there's not a thing that you could do to make God love you more. And there's not a thing that you can do to make God love you less. You know how freeing that is? Think about how much of life is spent trying to prove ourselves. We're always trying to justify our existence. We're trying to do something that makes us realize or know or believe that our life counts for something. You know, we see it in politics, we see it in, on social media, we see it in the sports fields, on the sports fields. I once, uh, I remember, took a course, uh, an honors course with a theologian named Ashley Null, Dr. Ashley Null, and uh, he, uh, he was an expert in English Reformation history. It sounds very boring, but actually fascinating. But one of the other things he was, was he was the chaplain for the Olympic Village for many years. In other words, whenever there was the Olympics, he was the go-to religious guy, right? If anybody had an issue, they could go to Dr. Ashley Null, and he would be kind of their counselor and their guide. And I remember him saying to us, he said, you know what it's like in the Olympic Village? Do you know what the atmosphere is like? We were all like, oh, it must be so amazing. He said, it's like death. It's like a funeral every day. He says, because for every race, there's only one winner. And there are 20 or whatever losers. And their life in that moment falls apart. It's like they're dead. Because their whole identity is wrapped up in this event, this race, whatever it is. They're trying to prove themselves. They're trying to make everyone else believe and maybe make themselves believe that they mean something, that they're worth something. See, that's what happens if we find our identity and our justification outside of Jesus. We're always trying to justify our existence. It's a tragic thing. We see it in everyday examples as well, ordinary life. Maybe a mom, a young mom, who who never feels she's doing well enough always feels like she's failing at keeping up the home or bringing up the kids. And she's forgotten that God accepts her because of Jesus. You see it in the teenager at school who lives for acceptance with their friends and will do whatever they can to kind of prove themselves. And they've forgotten that God accepts them because of Jesus. Or maybe the man working himself into the ground because he wants to make something of his life. Or the cancer patient who feels they better just say that last prayer just in case God is unhappy with them. Or that person going through a trial and is asking, what did I do that God has brought this on me? Have you ever said that? What have I done that God is punishing me? See, you've forgotten justification. You've forgotten that God has accepted you because of Jesus. And there is nothing that you can do to make God love you less. If at any point you think God is more pleased with you because of something you've done or less pleased with you because because of something you've done, basically what you're doing is you're declaring the cross to be a waste of time. That's what Paul says here, verse 21. He says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be attained or gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. No, I'm justified because of Jesus, and that changes everything, doesn't it? It means I can sleep soundly at night, and even if I don't wake up, I know God accepts me. So here's the first implication. I'm accepted. I don't have to prove myself. Here's the second one, though. The gospel means that I can be truly free. I can be truly free. God's acceptance of me because of Jesus gives me a completely new framework to live by, a completely new way to see everything. A life that is no longer performance-based, but acceptance-based. And it's even more than that. Look what Paul goes on to say. You know, one of the questions that you might ask, and Paul certainly asks, is, look, if, if if God accepts us because of Jesus, and we don't have to do anything, we don't have to jump through any hoops, doesn't that leave open the possibility of sin? Isn't that going to cause all kinds of chaos? Because we don't have this big stick of God's law to keep us in check, 
Paul says, no, not at all, because something more powerful is at work in you now than just a, a law to keep you in check. Verse 19 Paul says, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, when we put our faith in Jesus, it's not just there's a new paradigm that we're living by, an acceptance-based paradigm instead of a performance-based paradigm. It's actually a death and resurrection experience. The old me is dead, and a new me has been raised to life. Because I've been supernaturally joined to Jesus in such a way that everything he achieved on the cross, it's as if I achieved it. The old me has been crucified, my sins have been judged, my old life has been done away with, and I've been raised up to a brand new life. And now Christ lives in me. Isn't that an incredible phrase? Christ lives in me. His life courses through my veins so that his character begins to take hold of my character and transform it. And his values take hold of my values and and kind of upend and turn over everything that I used to value. The life I now live, Paul says, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And what Paul is saying, that's much more powerful than any system of do's and don'ts. And it's the only way to be free. Free from the burden of our sin, free from trying to earn our acceptance with God, free to truly live for Jesus. Have you experienced this freedom? Have you come to know it? I asked earlier, is God happy with you? Well, this passage tells us this morning, God couldn't be happier with you if you've trusted in Jesus. Not because of you, but because of Jesus. You belong to him forever, and there is not a thing that you can ever do to make him love you more. Amen? Let's pray together. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Oh, Lord, what wonderful news this is. What freeing news this is to know that we are loved unconditionally and accepted because of Jesus. Lord, help us not just to believe this, but help us to live this. Help us not to be hypocrites, but to live out this freedom in such a way that points people to Jesus and to the wonder of knowing him. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Jesus is the hero of the story. Let's stand and let's sing about him and all that he achieved for us.